Martin? Yes, uh, I thought no. I, 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 I you are one. Yes, I'll okay, be moderating. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, thanks, Annika, for this. And uh, <clears throat> yes. excuse my voice because I'm still recovering from one of the viruses in Brussels. I don't oh, know no. which one yet. But no, but thanks, thanks for Thank having you. this um, uh, uh, talks and uh, which you. is very, very timely, very timely to the extent that uh, I didn't get the, the, the analysis from my team in Egypt <laughs> to see. Uh, <laughs> yes, we're absolutely delighted to have you. So I'll, I'll start with a few words of introduction and then we're absolutely delighted uh, to have all of you come in and provide your reflections and insights um, on the basis of the discussions um, that you've had at the COP27. So as we should have our participants online at the moment, uh, let me just tell and say good afternoon to everyone and welcome to this EPC discussion on the COP27, on the outcomes and the next steps. I'm Annika Hedberg, I'm head of the Sustainable Prosperity for Europe program at the European Policy Center, and we'll be moderating today's discussion. We have the pleasure of having with us and hearing today from uh, Jake and uh, Jacob uh, Werksman, Principal Advisor at DG for Climate Action at the European Commission, Ahmed Saki, Second Secretary, um, the Mission of Egypt to the EU, Emmanuel Guerin, Executive Director at the European Climate Foundation, and uh, we should be joined also by Omnia El Omrani, the COP27 President Envoy on Youth, and I hope she will be joining us um, shortly. But just to say that, and perhaps as a bit of introduction uh, for the discussion today, I think we all know that we have no time to waste when it comes to climate action. And while our leaders have currently multiple crises to address from the social and economic repercussions of the COVID-19 pandemic to Russia's war in Ukraine, including its impacts for energy and food, addressing the climate emergency is more urgent than ever. And we see that the climate crisis is accelerating in scope and speed. And also at this COP, specific references were made to the tipping points, which reminds us of the gravity of the situation we are in. And it is worthwhile to keep in mind that the measures we take today to address our challenges, including related to energy and food, will have direct implications on where we find ourselves in the next years, in 2030 and 2050, and what the cost of climate change will be for us, our economies and societies. So after COP27, we've heard numerous experts um, provide their reflections on what was achieved. Um, many have voiced disappointment on the outcomes. Um, others have especially welcomed the agreement on the loss and damage fund as an example of the successes uh, achieved. So now if we consider the state of play with the climate emergency and in the, addressing the global climate crisis, we're very delighted to hear from you. And um, did COP27 deliver on its objectives? And we'll discuss today, today the outcomes, including the main achievements, um, also where perhaps did we see some failures? What is the way forward, including the obstacles, opportunities ahead? And I'm sure many in the audience are wondering whether you think there are any possibilities for us to still limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. And if not, what the impact of this could and should be. And as always, we look forward to having also questions and comments from our audience. And if you're interested to post questions, you can either just click to indicate if you wish to speak or alternatively, you can use the space provided to ask short written questions. To get us started, um, I would like to hand over the floor first to Ahmed Saki. And so you indeed, you're the second secretary from the mission of Egypt to the EU. And it would be very interesting to hear uh, what were Egypt's aims and hopes for the COP? Um, what were some of the main issues on the agenda? Where did we progress? Uh, where will more work perhaps be needed? And how happy are you yourselves with the outcome? Thank you so much for being with us. Well, thanks, Annika. Thanks very much for uh, for this introduction and for having this event. And 
Well, as you mentioned, some people are happy, some people are disappointed. But um, but I remember while preparing for uh, for the COP, not only me. I mean, preparing as engaging in 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 dialogue here with the EU. I always remember one thing that everyone agreed on. There is no one single COP which will deal with this crisis. So it's 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 not it's not it's not a matter of one conference that will achieve. The, the challenges that we all know, that keep the goals that we all know, but at the end of the day, it's 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 a process, process of willingness and and bearing the responsibility, uh, uh, showing solidarity between uh, different parties. So and and trust, which will come later for next steps, building trust and and and, and transparent dialogue uh, among the actors. So the thing is, at the end of the day. There is no one. No, there is no one conference which will will be able to solve this. But we believe. I believe uh, that uh, uh, what happened in Sharm el Sheikh, it gave it it paved the way again to to maintain and 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 create a new momentum to to shed the light on the very well known urgency of this crisis. So. We all know the 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 the, the, the urgency of, of of climate change. But it was very um, was it was very challenging to to the Egyptian presidency, given geopolitical uh, 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 context and nature right now. All the uh, the crisis we're facing, starting from COVID and then food security, uh, energy security. So it was not easy to 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 bring everyone back again. Hey guys, we still have the the, the climate change is there. It's not only. Uh, the energy prices or or, or 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 the food security, so so I, I would say that COP twenty seven first thing it succeeded in 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 delivering a message to the to the whole to all parties to the, to, to to everyone that we 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 remain committed to fight the climate change. We 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 upheld our responsibilities and. Uh, and we under we undertook the the important and uh, decisive decisions uh, that millions around the world are expecting from us. So this was one main message I, I see it very important. Uh, second thing, the momentum when you when we speak about the participation of uh, on uh, in, 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 the, in the in the in the conference, we have seen more than 100, 100 and almost hundred and ten head of states and governments that participated at the summit and seven and eight, more than three thousand ministers. Uh, average participation it reached one day twenty seven thousand. I I I I recall from the numbers uh, the team was mentioning uh, on on how uh, intense the discussions are. Um, uh, it uh, I see the the what happened in COP twenty seven. It was more of a package. Uh, uh, it started with the with the world with the leader summit, which has eight round tables which discussed. It's not only we're, fi we're, we're, we're fighting climate change to facing or addressing the challenges that we all know, but also how to work in a parallel path on how to accelerate the green transition. So it was not only uh, 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 how to face the challenges, but also how to create more momentum for the green hydrogen, for, uh, for, for the renewables, etc. So also, I think this this adds uh, um, to the uh, to the discussions before going to the negotiation part, which was very difficult. And Jacob here will will give us some insight on this. But um, as outcome, as I told you, like I, I think we we are satisfied with the with, with the out with the outcome. It's it's very important deal what we have reached in Tarmashe. Before we we started the the the, the conference in Sharm el Sheikh, we had the idea it's implementing COP. So it's time to move from pledges to implement to, to to actions to 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 deliverables to actions that to to ideas that can be implemented on the ground because we've been talking uh, for a long time, but but, but, but there, nothing is just not it's not nothing is achieved, but nothing is is concrete enough. Um, we we know the challenges. We have the ideas. We have the initiatives. We even have the money. But but at the end of the day, we need to know how to implement all of this together. We have the money, but we didn't achieve the goal of uh, of, of the hundred billion. Uh, we have the fund for adaptation, but uh, uh, everyone agrees on the urgency of adaptation to African countries. But and the money is there. The initiatives there. But 
we need more action. We need we need to know how to implement. So implementing COP that was the theme, and then we, we our main <clears throat> ideas was to tackle mitigation, adaptation, loss and damage, and finance. For loss and damage, I think it's historic that first of all it, it was included in the agenda, and then we reached the agreement on the uh, on the loss and damage fund um, on mitigation. At least I know people here are disappointed when it comes to mitigation, and that's what I have seen in the, in, in 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 across the news. Uh, but at least we 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 recommit. Uh, uh, that uh, uh, to keep the 1.5 goal uh, uh, within uh, reach. And then we have the Sharm el-Sheikh mitigation program, which will scale up mitigation ambition and the implementation. Um, for uh, the uh, adaptation, again, we have Glasgow Sharm el-Sheikh work program, uh, uh, which uh, will work on, 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 on having more conclusions um, uh, towards uh, COP28. Again, on finance, uh, we all agreed before before the COP that fi finance, we need to, to mobilize more uh, international uh, climate finance, uh, not only achieving the goal of the uh, 100 billion, but also post 2025 and how to uh, deploying a full uh, 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 instruments of, for, from grants and guarantees, etc. So I think uh, the Egyptian presidency uh, made it clear that finance is one of the main uh, 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 challenges that uh, we're uh, we're facing when it comes to uh, uh, to climate change. Um, so these were the main outcomes. But also, we had few uh, well, some commitments have been uh, uh, made uh, uh, during the COP twenty seven, uh, which they included from uh, adaptation to the nexus of water, food, energy. To deal with the water security, uh, with the food security, with the, uh, include or integrate the water uh, uh, um, um, in um, in the adaptation efforts. Um, so that also gives the 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 the, the, the multi dimension uh, uh, part of, of the COP twenty seven that we 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 wanted to tackle more. What are the urgencies we are having uh, right now? Food security, energy security. That's for sure. Um, we had few initiatives that have been uh, launched uh, uh, during the COP, uh, like the Green uh, Renewable Hydrogen Forum, which was uh, launched between uh, uh, Egypt and Belgium as co-sponsor, which basically it's it's to, to prove that we 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 are ready to 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 embrace the green transition according to the capabilities of each country, of course. Any transition, as we always say, should be balanced, inclusive, uh, and fair. Uh, uh, so, but also, we all agree that in order to address the energy security right now, the, 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 the challenge of, of energy security, we have to accelerate the green transition. So, and, the, and this brings us to the, uh, the, the, the green hydrogen, which is the future. So, uh, so the part of the initiatives focus on this and decarbonization and and all other topics which were included in the um, uh, in the thematic days um, so for the next steps well we all know as as our co-president minister shokri said we we we're, we're leaving sharm el sheikh with renewed hope in the future of our planet with an, with, the, with an even stronger collective will and more determination to achieve the temperature goal and Paris Agreement. We are having now Sharm el Sheikh mitigation ambition uh, 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 work program. We have the implementation uh, program of Sharm el Sheikh. We have the loss and damage fund. We have, we have maintained the, the momentum that, that proves that there is an urgency um what we should do i think from my point of view that we should keep working on more transparent dialogue lack of communication is very i think lack of communication was one of the main challenges uh, when it comes to climate change because it's something that we all agree how dangerous it is but there is always people like there's always uh, divergence in in in, in positions and I think this comes from lack of communication. So, so engaging between all parties is very important. 
which which will build trust and also will show solidarity, which will prove solidarity. Every uh, African countries know that the West, as this <laughs> the, the we we call it like this, are willing to 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 help them in in their adaptation efforts. But communication is important. Loss and damage it it it, it was included in the agenda, and we had this fund because we talked more about it. Like it, it was like it was never uh, we never had this kind of intense dialogue uh, between all actors when it comes to loss and damage. Um, again, I think we will for for next steps we should focus more on how to accelerate the green uh, uh, transition with a balance and pair transition, uh, uh, keeping in mind the uh, the difference uh, in in in, in uh, capabilities between the different the countries and all the parties. And again, uh, or finally, I would say we have to to maintain the momentum of implementation. We we should focus. We should keep this the focus implementation because without implementation, without achieving concrete actions, it will it will it will stay as it is. It will be only uh, initiatives and ideas scattered around the globe, and then. Uh, and and we have we have an opportunity. It's it's a huge challenge, but it's it, we have a a great opportunity, which is we all agree on one thing, which is which is <laughs> is not normal now. That we agree how urgent this uh, crisis is. We agree on we it we are we don't have time to waste. We're already behind. So uh, uh, this should be reflected on on, on fo in focusing more and on more of implementation. And sorry to take uh, long, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for this overview. And uh, I think in the discussion and perhaps also from the others in the panel, we'll hear more about the issues on the agenda as well as the processes, because obviously um, it is very important for us, as you said, and uh, stress yourself as well, implementation is the key. And we already have a number of commitments out there. And the question is, how can we speed up the implementation of uh, the commitments made and obviously also um, hike up the ambition even more as uh, we all agree on the need for urgent, uh, urgent action. As our next speaker, um, I'll be happy to give the floor to um, Jake Bergsman, uh, who indeed uh, is at the DG uh, Klima at the Commission, uh, acts as a principal advisor for international aspects of EU climate policy. The EU, uh, as often, has high hopes, uh, aims, and probably had also a number of aims uh, going into the COP27. Um, can you reflect a bit on the aims, the hopes, the expectations, and to what extent were these met at the COP27? Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Annika. <clears throat> and let me thank Ahmed um, and through him the, the Egyptian COP presidency for uh, arranging um, an amazing COP in the sense that, you know, the, the logistical challenges of pulling off something like this are, are really quite uh, um, intimidating and, and overwhelming. And I think for, for most participants, um, everything went, went smoothly. An incredible um, space was created for the negotiations that uh, at the end of the day, I think, I think helped to um, produce, uh, you know, a COP that, that uh, um, met some expectations but let me let me let me describe things from an eu perspective uh as, as the, that's the, the perspective i know best i mean we we went into the cop as as you suggested annika with with high expectations I, and i would describe them as being around urgency uh we we definitely wanted to see this cop build momentum from glasgow so we wanted to see momentum accelerating from from the the, the quite high standards of expectations that were set for us in glasgow particularly in the area of mitigation, um, but also obviously in the area of implementation as well, including the means of implementation. We went into the COP um, preparing to, to demonstrate solidarity as well as urgency. And we anticipated that this issue of loss and damage, which had been signaled uh, very strongly in Glasgow and had been discussed at the, the June sessions um, of the subsidiary bodies, would be on the agenda for Sharm el Sheikh as well. Exactly how it would be on the agenda and, and how it would end up at the end of the COP wasn't clear, but the EU certainly came in uh, to, to Sharm el Sheikh uh, with a willingness to show solidarity on that, um, uh, on, on that issue as well. 
And then, then finally, I think we came into to Charm with uh, an expectation that the combination of ambition and urgency would lead us to, to send signals that were about systemic change uh, and, and the potential for our process to have an impact on other processes and institutions. And this is obviously in the area of, of loss and damage where we had been encouraging our partners to focus on the need to, to change uh, the way in which our existing landscape of institutions that are already providing support to vulnerable communities around the world need to ramp up those efforts if they're going to be better prepared for a, 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 an increasingly warming planet, um, but also that we would need to seek ways of sending signals to the international financial institutions, the multilateral development banks, the private sector. We have to, to build COPs in a series of COPs that have an impact beyond our own limited regime uh, into, into the broader system. And we saw in Glasgow the first evidence uh, of those kinds of signals becoming clearer and sharper, and we wanted more of that uh, from the COP. So quite high expectations across um, all, all uh, those three dimensions of ambition, urgency, and, and a call for systemic change. Um, the, the end of the COP was very much shaped by the beginning of the COP. And um, the, in fact, the first all-nighters that uh, held negotiators was on trying to break the impasse on the design of the agenda, where the EU um, was prepared to uh, work with others to, to put loss and damage clearly on the, on the agenda of the COP, as long as we could do it in a way that was non-prejudicial in terms of the outcomes. Uh, so it would not, uh, at the outs of the COP, for example, predetermine that we would agree to establish a fund at the end of the COP. That was our position on that. Um, but we also, in the spirit of trying to, to seek systemic change, wanted to include an additional agenda item, which focused on the need to align overall financial flows with the Paris Agreement goals, um, the so-called Article 2.1c debate. Well, those all-nighters uh, allowed us to reach consensus on adding um, loss and damage to the agenda of both the CMA and the COP. But unfortunately, we couldn't gain uh, consensus on, on adding 2.1c at that stage. But so our, our expectations obviously had to, to adjust a bit. We, we kept fighting on all fronts throughout the COP, but um, uh, uh, that, 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 that what, what became clear at the end is that we would have to find some kind of answer to the question of how the regime at the very least would address the loss and damage issue and the financing of loss and damage more effectively than we've been able to do so far. Um, the intervening, I would say, 12 days uh, were really a, um, a, a, a building up to uh, a kind of a, of a deadlock on what became then the two main deliverables that were expected from this COP. One, a, a clear signal that we would move forward on mitigation ambition through a combination of the mitigation work program, which we had agreed to develop in Glasgow as a way of implementing the commitments that we made in Glasgow focused on raising ambition in the pre-2030 period. So getting our existing NDCs, our existing policies more aligned with 1.5. That was one key aspect of, uh, of the negotiations. And then the other uh, was what became of the agenda item on loss and damage. And the debate that, that persisted as to how and whether we could leave this COP with a decision uh, to set up and establish funding arrangements for loss and damage, and if so, whether those funding arrangements could include the establishment of a new fund. The deadlock, uh, I think, emerged over the fact that we couldn't form the normal coalitions of, of the willing and progressive parties on either of those issues. On loss and damage, the G77, tabled a proposal for a decision text that would have created a fund at COP27 based on the 1992 structures of the financial mechanism under the convention. In other words, a fund for which all developing countries would be equally eligible and only developed countries would be expected to contribute. And for us, that was a non-starter uh, because we're now in 2022 where it's much more clear which of the developing countries within uh, you know, th that, that mix need our help as a priority. 
And also there is a much clearer understanding of, of where the global flow of finance comes from in 2022. And that's not what's described in the annexes of the convention. So for us, that proposal was a non-starter, but there was a very strong and solid G77 position behind it. And so our normal progressive allies, uh, the vulnerable countries within the small island states and within the least developed countries, couldn't break from that position and to join us in some kind of balanced outcome. On the issue of, of mitigation, um, there was a similar kind of deadlock because there seemed to be a situation where the vulnerable countries had decided to put all of their political might, all of their voices behind the loss and damage issue and were reluctant to join us in pushing for more progressive outcomes on mitigation until that loss and damage issue was resolved. And this deadlock, this political deadlock, which really threatened the collapse of the COP, persisted all the way through to Thursday evening. So essentially the, the, the night before the COP was scheduled to conclude. And, and faced with that, uh, that prospect, um, the, the, the EU uh, decided to try to see whether we could shake things up a bit and offer a different kind of, of landing ground to the rest of the parties. And, and that was by our signaling our willingness uh, to join a consensus in establishing a fund for uh, financing loss and damage at this COP establishing it in principle, of course, because we can't establish a fund from one, one night to the next. But on the condition that that fund demonstrate that it would add value as compared to existing funds that we've created in the past by focusing particularly on the needs of the most vulnerable developing countries, and that it would be open to finding resources other than from the conventional donor base. This would be a fund that would not be based on the principle of liability and compensation, uh, as was agreed when the agenda item was established, but rather on the principles of solidarity and the recognition that the international community has an obligation, and the rich countries in particular, uh, to provide assistance to countries experiencing uh, the threats uh, uh, and, and the, the realities of these kinds of, of impact. We made that offer in the broader context of wanting to see a deal that included more ambition on mitigation action as well, that would leave the signals from the Glasgow Climate Pact intact as the main guiding principles, which should be used to focus our work in the pre-2030 period. And we hope that we could add a bit more to that as well, um, given that a year has passed uh, and that uh, our understanding of where the solutions lie um, has sharpened uh, even more, and our, certainly our sense of urgency uh, uh, has had sharpened uh, as well. So we we put that that um, the, the outlines of that potential landing ground on the table, and I, I do think it changed the dynamic of the negotiations, and we saw um, significant progress on both of those lines of of, of negotiations uh, uh, from that from that moment on. There wasn't much time left. Um, but fortunately, the, the co-facilitating ministers um, and the, the Egyptian COP presidency have been working on draft decision text that um, lent itself towards a series of, of constant improvements that moved us uh, closer to the kinds of uh, landing grounds that uh, the EU proposal um, described. I won't say, and we can get into this detail um, when, when we, we have a chance to hear from others, but also some questions from the audience, that we absolutely hit the mark, uh, either in terms of what we'd like to have seen uh, from the funding arrangements or that we would have liked to see uh, from, from mitigation. But I think overall, uh, we did uh, signal the establishment of funding arrangements, including a fund that will have that particular focus, but also have that, that broader opportunity to raise resources. And we certainly uh, survived with most of the, the Glasgow Climate Pact intact in verbatim, basically in the Sharm el-Sheikh implementation plan um, and a mitigation work program that spells out um, how uh, we will be discussing progress on, on each of the fronts that were outlined in the Glasgow Climate Pact through a series of, of, of focused engagements between now and the next COP and the next COP after that, I think until 2026. Uh, so, but let me stop there. Uh, I, I mean, I would agree with others that 
when um, the final results were gaveled through and, and there was no debate in the final plenary about those results, everyone accepted at the end of the day that the balance, the final balance is that the Egyptian COP presidency was able to, to, to strike, um, that the, the final plenary uh, was um, a, 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 you could get a sense of mixed feelings as to whether we had made uh, enough progress at this COP to really justify the, the impulse of momentum that we got from Glasgow. But also, I think, as Ahmed said, a recognition that as at the end of every COP, um, you know, the real work begins. Um, and so uh, we'll, we'll, I'm sure we'll come to a point when someone will ask, well, what specifically do we have to do in the coming year? And the answer will be even more um, than we had thought uh, when, when the COP began. More processes, more committees, more work programs um, that will, will keep us all busy. Uh, and that's beyond what we had already committed to under under previous mandates from previous COPs. Thanks. Thank you so much for providing that European perspective. Uh, and uh, indeed, we'll be happy to come back to several of the points made, and obviously uh, on the both the processes as well as issues on the agenda. Because certainly, I'm sure that also our audience has questions on that. Omnia, um, you have joined us now. I hope um, if you'll be able to turn on your camera, I'll be happy to um, hand over the floor to you. Hello. Yes, you're there. Great. Yeah, no, of course, I'm very can, can, sorry because I'm currently in the hospital, so I'm not able to open my camera because of okay. the connection. It's okay. So just um, to introduce you to our audiences, so Omnia El Omrani, uh, you're the COP27 President Envoy on Youth. We understand that you're in a hospital at the moment working there, uh, which is why uh, your connection is poor, but we're very delighted that you'll be able to give a few reflections and uh, especially obviously interesting to hear what are your takeaways uh, from Sharmel's Char shake and if you can tell a bit about the youth engagement at the COP27 that would be great but I understand the connection may not be very good so I, I may stop um, you at some point if we can't hear you properly but hopefully we could, we'll be able to get a few insights from you thank you perfect can you hear me well is it yes. okay now Okay, yes, thank you so much for having me. My apologies about this unexpected uh, hospital shift that I am in now. Uh, but nevertheless, I'm very excited to join the first post-COP uh, conversation, uh, which has been a great opportunity for me to share the youth uh, engagement milestones we had in Egypt, but also focus on the broader work of what we did as the COP27 presidency. So this was the first time uh, at COP that there is a, an appointment of a youth envoy and our vision was to have a link between youth-led perspectives, solutions, as well as challenges and demands and the work of the presidency and its integration. What we did for the first time is that in the Glasgow Climate Pact, it was mandated that the next presidency would have a, a youth-led dialogue between uh, policymakers and young experts in a way that is intergenerational. And this this is what we did. We had a conference of youth, Koi, in Sharm el-Sheikh from the 2nd to the 4th of November. We had over 1,100 young people from 149 countries. Together, we worked on three days on the Global Youth Statement, which is the key policy outcome of what young people would like to see in all the different facets of the negotiations, whether it's adaptation, mitigation and so on and then for the first time we took the global youth statement and on the youth day which is november 10th we held two roundtable discussions we invited the chairs of country groups negotiators as well as ministers uh, on in two different high level roundtables on uh, one on adaptation and loss and damage and one on mitigation and just transition in the roundtable discussions we had also youth experts youth practitioners they were given the floor first and it was more of a co-creation roundtable of what are the key policy asks that we would like to see the negotiators take into consideration. And then what we did, the outcomes from the roundtable discussions, we worked on that in its integration in the final COP27 outcome document for the Sharm el-Sheikh implementation plan. And then we also had for the first time the Children and Youth Pavilion, which is a youth-led space that has been independently created by the young people, for the young people, facilitating sessions, workshops, but also inviting the policymakers to come to the pavilion, including the Prime Minister of Barbados, Mary Robinson, the Minister of the Maldives of the Environment, and all the different key actors 
to speak with the young people and see how our, integ our perspectives can be further integrated. I think one of the key outcomes from COP27 in the Sharm el Sheikh implementation plan is that for the first time, children were mentioned explicitly across all the three articles that addressed youth uh, that started from Article uh, 88 to Article 91. And in, in terms of recognizing the role of children, because also at COP we had two sessions, dialogues between children and uh, ministers of education and human rights experts to see how climate education can be means of, of young uh, climate leaders, children and adolescents, as well as framing the climate crisis as a child rights crisis and creating an um, implementation mechanism for that. So we had the mention of children in the outcome. We also had the recognition of the youth envoy position for all the future presidencies. So even go beyond having a single envoy, but having a team of young representatives within the presidency to really reflect youth perspectives away ahead of COP throughout the year of the presidency itself and beyond. And then the second thing was the recognition of, and of the outcomes of the Conference of Youth for the first time to note the global youth statement and also the youth dialogue, which we held where the roundtable discussions took place and urging future presidencies to do the same, as well as creating a children and youth pavilion as a dedicated, inclusive, safe space, not just for young uh, experts who are coming to COP, but also for children and adolescents who are now being more present and there. And the most important was to really recognize the integration of not just having young representatives within official country delegations, but to also have them as young leaders. And this year we had many, we had over um, 22 countries that had young climate negotiators under 35 who were trained by the Climate Young Negotiators Program in 22 countries uh, to really have a more, uh, a more effective inclusion of youth perspectives by being not just uh, by being also at the negotiating table but also looking at the broader uh, perspective of COP outcomes which is a the loss and damage fund for the first time and this was an objective that was coming from the from both uh, parties to really demonstrate global solidarity as well as the importance of having um, an institutionalized mechanism that helps fund and support uh, developing countries and small state islands that are impacted most, especially by the detrimental impacts of climate change, not only on the economy as well as the society, but also on the health of the populations, especially the health of the children and the youth that we are seeing in many countries around the world. And then this was something that we as young, um, as young people were really pushing for, not having our world leaders fail us, but to have the loss and damage fund as a demonstration, as a step forward towards the protection of our health and our future. And then the next step was also keeping the 1.5 uh, goal alive by having a robust mitigation work program. And this was one of the key recommendations we had coming out of the global youth uh, statement. We also had a, a focus on the global goal on adaptation, having a defined framework for the goal and based on that, have a follow up in terms of how all the sectors can adapt and with the upcoming workshops that will be taking place in the, in the upcoming year uh, to really enable and empower the parties to cope and to adapt to the accelerating impacts of climate change, especially that there was also for, 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 the, for the outcome itself, the right to a healthy environment was mentioned and was addressed specifically just to really emphasize, and this is the first time that this UN resolution that was just done, uh, adopted this year, it was mentioned in another key outcome document, and this took place in the Sharm el Sheikh implementation uh, plan or the COP27 outcome. Thank, thank you, Omnia. Uh, we're very pleased that you were able to join us, uh, even for these reflections and I know that you will need to leave shortly, but just wanted to say a big thank you for sharing your thoughts um, and uh, kind of your takeaways from, from the COP. And obviously we very much hope that in the future, um, the youth element, the, the fact that you have young climate negotiators and these discussions uh, fully reflect that this ultimately is a crisis. Uh, it's also an intergenerational crisis. And uh, let's hope that in the future as well, these um, 
dimensions will be brought in um, even stronger than ha what has been the case in the past. But uh, Omnia, thank you so much for joining us. I hope you'll be able to listen in for a little bit longer. Uh, but uh, I will now hand over to our last speaker, um, Emmanuel Guerin, uh, who is the Executive Director at the European Climate Foundation. Uh, we're really um, happy to hear um, what your evaluation is of um, what was achieved, where are we, uh, where is it that we need to go now from, um, from the COP27. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Annika, and thanks for the invitation and the opportunity to uh, discuss with um, other panelists and uh, respond to uh, questions uh, from the audience. Um, I'll build on the um, points uh, that were um, outlined uh, uh, by the previous uh, speakers um, and very much in the uh, context uh, that was uh, described uh, by both um, um, Ahmed and uh, Jacob, which was one um, um, of um, um, a fairly um, uh, challenging um, context uh, for um, holding a COP um, due to the um, consequences um, of Russia's war um, in uh, Ukraine. Um, the outcome um, of uh, COP27 uh, very much uh, feels indeed uh, like a mixed bag. Um, and I'd like to um, um, focus um, um, to start with um, on a few important um, achievements um, that uh, this COP um, made. Um, I'll mention three um, in particular. Um, I'll, I'll continue by um, highlighting uh, uh, some of the uh, missed opportunity um, of um, this COP and uh, conclude briefly by um, saying a few words about the um, uh, very important role uh, that Europe uh, played um, in this COP um, as um, Jacob started to um, uh, allude to. Um, on the um, important achievements um, first, um, um, as was already mentioned um, and um, as um, um, has received uh, the most attention uh, so far, um, the progress uh, that was made um, on the um, establishment of a fund and funding arrangements uh, more generally for uh, loss and damage um, feels um, like um, a very important breakthrough um, that this COP um, achieved um, and one um, that is very welcome. Um, it is um, obviously um, not a new um, issue um, in these um, negotiations. Um, it was uh, um, already um, a very um, hot um, issue uh, by the time of um, uh, COP21. Um, and one um, 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 that uh, we had to deal with uh, when um, I was um, a member of the French um, presidency team, um, um, it felt a bit overdue uh, that um, such funding arrangements um, um, are made uh, because it is indeed um, a uh, matter of um, uh, climate justice, uh, but also uh, very importantly, um, a matter of uh, um, international uh, solidarity uh, to the most vulnerable, um, as um, Jake uh, mentioned. Um, of course, um, um, uh, there is a lot that still um, needs to be done uh, when it comes to the um, operationalization of this fund um, very much um, in the context um, of other uh, funding arrangements, um, as uh, Jacob mentioned, um, um, and in particular, uh, the Global Shield um, initiative um, that is um, uh, championed by uh, Germany um, and um, a few other uh, countries. Uh, very important indeed um, that a fund uh, that is placed um, uh, within um, uh, the Convention and the Paris Agreement um, addresses uh, the need um, of the most vulnerable um, countries. Um, um, and I'm stressing this point uh, because we've heard um, repeatedly uh, from uh, some of the most um, vulnerable 
um, countries, in particular um, uh, small island um, and developing states, um, as well as um, some of the least developed countries, um, that the Global Shield um, initiative doesn't um, necessarily uh, respond to their needs, um, or rather that they're not necessarily going to be um, able to benefit uh, from uh, the opportunities um, that it brings um, uh, to the table because they don't necessarily have a strong enough banking system uh, to uh, benefit from uh, this um, insurance uh, policy. So um, really important um, indeed to hold firm um, on the prioritization um, of the needs uh, for the fund extremely important um, as well um, indeed to broaden um, um, uh, the basis for um, who is providing uh, finance um, uh, to this fund. Um, um, and I'm thinking in particular uh, that uh, since um, um, emissions coming from uh, fossil fuels um, are um, uh, primarily uh, responsible for uh, those um, impacts, um, uh, pushing for um, a tax on uh, fossil fuels um, consumptions or exports or um, any other uh, solutions um, um, is um, um, an important um, principle uh, to keep in mind um, as we move uh, forward um, in the uh, operationalization um, of the fund. Um, second, um, and it has received a bit um, less attention, I think um, it was um, interesting um, and in fact important um, uh, to see um, uh, the COP um, outcome uh, reflect um, the importance that renewable energies um, have to play um, in delivering um, um, uh, the transition uh, to uh, zero emission, um, including very uh, specifically um, the need of a four trillion um, investment um, in renewables uh, by uh, 2030, um, which uh, provides um, um, a very important uh, quantitative um, target for uh, the scaling up um, of the financing um, uh, for the deployment of renewable energy. Um, I'll note um, on this um, second point uh, uh, that um, uh, an important Just Energy Transition Partnership, JETP, uh, was announced for um, Indonesia um, um, uh, during the uh, uh, second week of the COP. It was announced from uh, Bali, uh, where um, the G20 um, was um, taking place. Um, it's a very important um, 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 partnership uh, that was announced for uh, 20 billion um, of dollars for the next uh, three to five years um, to um, accelerate um, the clean energy transition um, in Indonesia. Uh, the phasing out of coal, uh, the phasing in um, of renewable energy, um, uh, the peaking um, um, of emissions from the uh, power sector um, in Indonesia um, uh, by 2030 at the latest, uh, which is earlier uh, than the uh, previous uh, commitment from um, Indonesia, um, as well as um, the increase of the share of um, renewable energy to uh, uh, 34% um, percent, uh, by that time, um, and the 20 billion will be made um, of a combination of public and uh, private um, uh, finance, uh, uh, in particular through um, uh, GFENS, um, uh, the Global uh, Financial Alliance uh, for um, Net Zero. Um, it's um, an important development um, um, after um, a similar um, uh, commitment was made um, by South Africa uh, last year um, in Glasgow, um, and uh, to some extent uh, to um, a similar um, commitment that was made by Egypt to um, uh, phase out uh, some of the um, inefficient um, gas uh, power generation uh, that it has to replace uh, that by renewable energy a combination of solar um, and uh, offshore wind um, in particular. Uh, thirdly, um, and I think um, it may be uh, the most important um, outcome of the COP, um, uh, the building uh, momentum, uh, which is um, gaining not just traction, uh, but clarity uh, for uh, the uh, um, urgent need of reform 
um, of the international financial um, institutions, um, which is very much um, a way to operationalize um, Article 2.1c um, of the Paris Agreement, um, as uh, Jake mentioned um, earlier. Um, it's a discussion that took place on the basis of a report um, that was put together uh, by Nick Stern um, and uh, Vera Songwe um, that included um, uh, many important um, um, elements um, including um, a uh, quantitative um, aspirational target for the tripling um, of the lending capacity um, of the um, multilateral uh, development banks. Um, and uh, that is um, uh, a um, achievement uh, that will very much need uh, careful uh, follow through um, uh, next year to uh, start responding to your question, uh, starting with um, uh, the meeting of the World Bank um, and uh, the IMF um, and continuing with uh, uh, the summit that President uh, Macron announced uh, for June, very much in support um, of the um, initiative um, championed by the Prime Minister of uh, Barbados, uh, Mia Motley, um, uh, who is asking in particular for uh, something that uh, sounds absolutely right, um, which is uh, debt service suspension closes um, in case um, of um, um, climate catastrophe uh, that impact more than um, a percentage um, of some countries' uh, GDP. Uh, but um, um, the uh, larger um, issue uh, will really be um, the capacity um, of the um, um, international financial um, institutions to scale up um, the investments um, in the energy and climate uh, transitions um, uh, more generally, um, as I said, with uh, the view to uh, triple uh, the lending capacity. Um, a few missed um, opportunities. Um, well, first, um, we didn't see um, much of an acceleration um, of the uh, mitigation um, commitments, um, which is um, a cause for uh, great concern because it means that we're um, um, uh, seeing uh, the 1.5 uh, degree uh, temperature uh, limit objective uh, dangerously uh, slipping away. Um, and so that is very much uh, what will need to be um, uh, the very strong um, emphasis of the COP um, uh, next year, uh, but also of all um, efforts um, in the coming months um, uh, before that. Um, a missed opportunity, I think, um, on adaptation, um, uh, because um, the COP um, um, in Glasgow uh, provided um, um, a very important objective um, of going to 50% of international climate finance for um, adaptation. And we've seen um, some countries, in particular in Europe, um, move closer uh, towards uh, this goal, but we're still very far uh, from uh, this objective. Um, and I think we could have seen uh, more um, um, efforts being put uh, towards um, increasing um, international uh, climate finance for um, adaptation. Um, and um, thirdly, um, very much a missed opportunity um, on uh, the language um, around um, the phasing out of fossil fuel um, emissions um, at large, um, as Jake um, uh, mentioned. Um, everybody will um, appreciate um, how difficult, um, if possible at all, um, it is in the context of the multilateral uh, system where uh, decisions are taken by consensus uh, to anchor uh, that language, which uh, faced very strong resistance uh, by uh, Russia and Saudi Arabia um, in particular. Um, and yet we shouldn't fool ourselves um, if we're not able to articulate a plan um, uh, that shows how we are uh, phasing out um, emissions from all fossil fuels um, and not just coal, uh, we will not um, uh, be successful um, in the climate uh, transition. To conclude, um, as I said, um, um, I think it's important, um, um, in particular in an event uh, convened uh, by you at the European Policy Centre, to uh, stress the very constructive role uh, that Europe uh, played um, at this COP. Um, it was not easy, um, in particular internally uh, within Europe. Um, uh, the 
um, um, European coordination was ma made more difficult than in the past uh, by the outcomes of the elections um, in both Sweden and Italy. Uh, it therefore uh, required a lot of uh, political courage uh, by the vice president um, in charge of the Green Deal, Franz Timmermans, um, to uh, move a few lines um, compared to what was um, uh, the position um, um, uh, of the EU uh, going into this COP, um, as um, Jake um, said, um, very much supported by um, a few ministers um, who've played um, an important role, ministers and special envoys from Germany, from Spain, from Denmark and the Netherlands um, um, in particular. Um, but um, I think it speaks to um, the leadership and the flexibility um, um, of Europe um, that um, indeed uh, we were uh, um, able um, in the end uh, to rescue um, uh, from a uh, possible uh, failure um, of the COP um, in Charmelchia. Thank you so much, Emmanuel, uh, for your reflections. And I actually would be happy to come back to Ahmed and um, Jake for any reactions you may have. And I, especially I took, for example, what you said uh, about um, the, the loss and damage. And when we're thinking of the sources of finance, this idea of uh, putting on a tax on fossil fuel exports and consumption as a source of revenue. Um, I would be happy to know, for example, was that discussed at, uh, at any length? Uh, and could this be an option? Um, and obviously, I'm happy to hear any other reactions you have uh, to what has been said. Also, um, I would be, and this is uh, for all of you, but uh, what really kind of what I'm trying to gather myself is that obviously we had numerous promises that were made during the COP26 in Glasgow. Uh, we had uh, seen countries being asked to come back with strengthened emission reduction commitments, the NDC, uh, NDCs. Um, where are we with these? And obviously we saw a lot of declarations, announcements uh, in Glasgow on forest and land use, on global methane pledge. Uh, we had uh, the talk about phasing down coal power, phasing out inefficient fossil fuel subsidies, strengthening ocean-based action. So um, when we're talking about implementation, it would be nice to know where are we with these promises and announcements and uh, that were made in Glasgow. Um, a year ago. So uh, reflections, comments on that would be would be interesting to hear from you. Um, I don't know, Ahmed, would you like to go first? <laughs> well, I'll uh, I'll leave to Jacob what happened in Sharm Sheikh because <laughs> I was not there. <laughs> no, but I will come to the loss and damage fund. Uh, I'm, uh, to be honest, I'm not sure if it was discussed the um, uh, the. Uh, how to move forward and 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 uh, how to mobilize the funds and everything, but I think as as long as we reach this and and, and there is a willingness, then we'll be able to 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 mobilize the fund because we have the fund. Um, but the thing is, with f fossil fuels and putting taxes on export, etc. This is quite a tricky part because. Um, as I was mentioning, when we were speaking about uh, transition, the green transition, it has to be um, uh, 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 balanced and inclusive, meaning that um, uh, like each and every country, including the African countries and, most, and developing and most vulnerable countries, they have their own uh, uh, capabilities that they cannot, they, they, like as we say, they would love to, to, to phase out, but according to what to 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 what the to 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 their abilities, so uh, uh, the idea of uh, like the green deal we have been following the the green deal uh, from the European Commission, uh, which will have its implication implications on the uh, on the trade relations, for example, between third countries and the EU, especially when we speak about the carbon tax mechanism, etc. So uh, uh, and this again it takes me to. The dialogue the uh, between the parties because it, it, it's the solution will not having taxes on on the exports of these third countries to the eu or to whatever uh, uh, to the co and, the, and the, um, uh, to, to to deal with this but how to support these countries 
to to phase down their uh, their uh, uh, um, fossil fuels and decarbonization efforts, etc. Especially, um, for example, uh, when I speak about Egypt, that we have our climate strategy until 2050, and we have our goals of, of increasing the share of renewables um, uh, by 42% uh, by 2035, and and um, and, and and the parallel track where we have been convening lots of uh, of, of um, MOUs and 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 uh, and, and agreements on uh, uh, renewables and green hydrogen etc so this adds to the effort of decarbonization but the end uh, um, as 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 I was saying um, we have to do more NDCs yes it's it was not to be honest for me I was a bit surprised that not too many countries uh, uh, updated their uh, national uh, uh, determined contribution, so that this has we have to work on. Um, and um, again, with the declar well, you you mentioned the declarations on Glasgow and other initiatives that uh, were uh, mentioned, and it, uh, I think it's it's I don't know uh, uh, how is there kind of I don't know I'm thinking loudly like is there kind of a follow up mechanism that we should know where are we in each and every goal that we agree upon so that to 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 spare us the time and the effort that we have to uh, to wait for one year to discuss what we discussed in Sharm Sheikh I don't know like we have to have an implement implementation mechanism let's say and uh, so that we don't have to for, for one complete year before we try to uh, to 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 achieve part of what we have agreed upon but i don't know so we we'll, we'll think out loudly together thank you thank you and jake yeah <clears throat> i mean on, on the ndcs uh quite a few parties did update i can't i lost track but it was it was moving to almost 30 the last time i checked um, between Glasgow and Sharm el Sheikh. So some responded to the call, but they either were, were quite small countries in terms of their emissions, or they were big countries that didn't make significant changes to their NDCs. So they didn't really significantly you know, move the needle with regard to, to 1.5. Um, and that's going to continue to be a challenge. I mean, in some ways, Glasgow's expectation that every party is going to review a fundamental part of its domestic policy annually between now and, and 2030 might be asking a, a bit much. So I think we have to kind of expand our, our theory of change in terms of how we raise ambition that includes um, the, the, the greater focus on, on sectors, uh, a greater focus on the kinds of, of JetP support for major economies with regard to their implementation plans. And we'll see whether uh, what, what uh, the breakthrough in Indonesia and uh, the work that we're doing with Vietnam and with other countries leads to a change in NDC. Um, but what's most important is that it, it leads to a change in their in their policies and their emissions pathways. So you know, I'm, we're hoping that the mitigation work program helps to provide a space for that um, it more in depth, uh, less superficial conversation that focuses exclusively on the pledges. That doesn't mean that we should take the pressure off the NDCs or, frankly, the long-term strategies either. But um, you know, hopefully, expanding our 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 points of our entry points for 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 uh, for leverage um, on the the funding arrangements for loss and damage and where the money might come from, including from innovative sources. Um, you know, we think that we've we've agreed language that accompanies the funding arrangements as well as the fund that is quite unique um, in the sense that, that we are establishing a, a new set of arrangements for the first time with all parties recognizing that the conventional sources won't be enough. And so that a big challenge of the design phase will be trying to identify innovative sources. That's different, from example, from the GCF, where that was launched at the same time that we confirmed the $100 billion goal, and there was an expectation that it would be the money generated by that setting of that goal, that new goal that would that would fund uh, the, um, uh, the the GCF. So you you know you have language that I think is quite new in terms of identifying and expanding sources of funding, um, looking at innovative sources of funding that could lead us to focusing on things like um, new new forms of, of taxation. 
However, we, we have to be modest about what's within the ability of, of this regime to do on its own, right? We can set things like long-term goals, like the 100 billion uh, through decisions of, of the parties, but we can't directly affect the taxation policy uh, of parties. We have to go through a series of, of layers of influence um, that start with a signal from our process, but then run through organizations like the OECD, um, conversations that happen bilaterally between parties that that uh, will will try to reach again other and alternative and additional leverages of, of change. I think this is the first time we've ever had the spring meetings of the bank mentioned specifically in our process uh, as well. So we we not just have new ideas, but we have identified entry points and moments in in the calendar that show that our regime is is expecting to catalyze um, more more and more. Um, other quick comments that I make is, first of all, how impressive for Dr. El Amrani to step out of her responsibilities at the hospital um, to, to join us for a few minutes and, and demonstrate um, such an, a broad understanding of all the complexities that were happening at the COP. So big kudos to, to her. It makes me feel quite, quite, quite humble by comparison. Um, I just turned on my, my Zoom link. Um, but uh, uh, she also, I think, touched upon that there was a lot more going on at this COP um, and at the, the, you know, a lot going on at every COP that we never have the chance to touch upon uh, when we're just giving the, the highlights. Um, even in the negotiations, we were working on strengthening the transparency regime, completing the rules on carbon markets, um, working more on, on the agricultural sector and what we can deliver there. You know, there's new language on forests and on oceans and uh, certainly as, as she was pointing out on youth and human rights as well. Um, so. Uh, a, a lot more to be captured. And then one final point um, in terms of Emmanuel's comments. We did make an important additional pledge in uh, Glasgow with regard to adaptation finance, but it, it wasn't the 50-50 pledge that some sought. Uh, it was rather the doubling of adaptation finance, which uh, for the EU is the more sensible goal. And I agree it's going to be challenging to meet, but um, we're, we're doing everything we can to deliver on that in the EU. Great, thanks. Emmanuel, uh, did you want to react as well? Not necessarily to react, but maybe um, to mention something we've not mentioned because we were um, narrowly focusing on um, 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 interpreting the outcomes of two weeks of negotiations, but obviously um, something huge um, that happened um, in between um, the COP in Glasgow and the COP in Sham uh, was uh, the passing um, of the Inflation Reduction Act um, in the US, um, which um, I think um, overall um, was very good news, um, in particular because um, um, everybody, um, including um, colleagues um, in the US, uh, seemed to have lost hope um, um, that um, it would be um, possible uh, to do this um, in the context of extreme uh, political uh, polarization in the US on many issues, um, including um, climate. Um, um, and it is um, going to um, accelerate um, um, uh, quite significantly uh, with uh, 370 billion um, on the table for the next 10 years or so, um, uh, the deployment of both renewable energy and, and electric cars, et cetera. Um, it was not perfect, um, however, uh, which is, um, I think, how um, it was um, received um, at the COP um, and not perfect from um, at least uh, three different perspectives, um, one being the level of ambition um, of the IRA um, um, in spite of the staggering uh, number, because um, I think it delivers roughly two thirds um, of the uh, US and DC, and there is a missing third uh, for which um, uh, the US um, is going to have to um, uh, come up with a plan um, at some point. And I'm mentioning that because it makes it very difficult for um, Europe as well, uh, because uh, um, it means not, not, not having, uh, um, uh, you know, world superpower um, in a position of truly um, leading. Um, um, second, um, uh, the local content requirements um, uh, within um, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, which are uh, making it a very live um, issue in between European and uh, Americans um, in the moment with uh, possible uh, WTO rules uh, violations. So um, certainly um, not easy. Um, and uh, 
third, um, uh, because uh, there was uh, 370 uh, billion um, uh, for domestic uh, climate transition in the US, but um, close to nothing on international um, uh, climate finance, which uh, um, again um, is probably the main reason why uh, we're not um, at 100 billion um, of international climate finance uh, mobilized. So um, I just thought it was important to put it on the table uh, because otherwise, um, you know, we're talking about Europe and small islands and the least developed countries, but uh, uh, certainly uh, the situation um, in between the US and, and, and China um, um, uh, was uh, one of the important uh, factors uh, going into this COP. Thank you very much. And I actually would like to pick up on that, um, because obviously there's the world outside the COP, and uh, we have a lot of develop developments happening uh, within countries, but also between countries, we have a lot of geopolitical tensions nowadays. So just would like to get your feeling as to what extent, and obviously the pressures go beyond the geopolitical tensions we have, the, um, we're just the, the social and economic repercussions of the COVID-19 pandemic. Now the cost of the living crisis, uh, which is not just in Europe. Uh, we know that uh, the, the suffering and the cost that the social pressures are on across the world. So just to get the feeling as to on one hand on the kind of big scheme of things, how are these pressures and how did these pressures reflect in the discussions, be it the COVID-19 pandemic, the Russian war in Ukraine, uh, and the geopolitical tensions, for example, between US and China, how were these reflected in the negotiations? And then on, on more of on this specific question on some of the major powers. Where, what were some of the big surprises you saw, uh, for example, in case of India, Australia? Um, what would you say about the role of Russia, Saudi Arabia, Brazil at the COP? Um, and I think our audience may be interested to know kind of were there nice surprises, were there nasty surprises? What were um, some of your takeaways from the kind of big um, big environment, the bigger environment where we are and where the COP happened, um, the implications of that, as well as the ongoing do domestic developments. Um, I don't know, Jake, do you want to start <laughs> as you were there? <laughs> uh, sure, I can, I can give it a, give it a start. I mean, in terms of, of nice surprises from, um, from big players, uh, I, I would put India at the top of the list with their, their proposal to expand the Glasgow pledge uh, to phase down coal to include all fossil fuels. That was something that um, you know we, we, we looked at with a lot of interest and we tried to build some momentum behind but um, never 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 captured consensus. I mean I, I'm sure there were there were some mixed motivations behind India's move, but I think it was largely out of a, a sense of, of what they see as fairness that, you know, if you're going to net zero, you've got to phase out all fossil fuels. And if you focus exclusively on coal in that commitment, it does tend to favor um, those industrialized countries that, that have already moved largely out of coal. And so why not expand it? Um, you know, we were a little reluctant to take the focus off coal, but I think if we'd found the right um, form of words that uh, we certainly could have agreed with, with India on that. Unfortunately, it was, it was blocked by, by others. Um, that has strong support from Colombia, by the way, which is they kept reminding us we're we're in favor of this, even though we're the fifth largest exporter of coal. So um, lots of, of strong um, uh, ambition coming from the uh, progressive uh, ILAC countries as well. India also um, announced on the 14th its its first long term strategy to get to net zero at the COP. And, and I, you know, I wish that had made more headlines as well, that this was their additional piece that was part of a reaction to the Glasgow Climate Pact to call upon parties that hadn't done, yet done done that to do so. I haven't had a chance to analyze it, but I think um, symbolically that that was uh, important as well. Big surprises from the U.S. Uh, well, I suppose it was sending their leader several days late. Um, <laughs> uh, I don't know how surprised the Egyptian presidency was with that, but um, you know, after having uh, several days of, of of leaders on the seventh and the eighth with all the media attention and, and plenary uh, space dedicated to the international community as a whole um, to essentially have uh, the same space uh, and the same attention dedicated to one country's leader alone uh, was a bit odd in a UN context, but uh, nonetheless, it was good that he made the effort. I'm not sure that he announced much new. Uh, you know, he drew upon the, the, uh, the IRA 
uh, and the efforts that the U.S. has been making to push um, um, greater emissions in methane, which we're partnering with them on. Uh, and he also implied that the, the U.S. was looking to organize um, more action from the private sector through voluntary carbon markets, um, all of which were, were interesting. What was missing from the commitment, of course, was they're making up for the gap in climate finance uh, that still um, is uh, very, very large, as Emmanuel pointed out, um, not covered by the Inflation Reduction Act, requires a separate congressional appropriation in order to get the 11 billion uh, additional finance that the White House has been promising. And my understanding is the political prospects for that are not very high. <laughs> um, from Brazil, I don't think we saw any, any major shifts. I mean, they're still operating under the existing administration. Um, as uh, I think Emmanuel pointed out, the president-elect uh, did come to Sharm el-Sheikh, but uh, uh, no, no major shifts in their position as far as, uh, as we can tell. The, the less happy surprises, I guess, came in trying to calculate what, what exactly is Glasgow plus from this meeting, particularly in the area of mitigation ambition. Uh, you know, it is the mitigation work program. It is the, re the reaffirmation verbatim of a lot of the good stuff from the Glasgow Climate Pact. Um, but that, that addition of renewables to the mix came with a little price tag attached, which I'm not for sure that everyone fully understands. But the language on renewables, which is good, um, to me, it's kind of low-hanging fruit. We probably could have easily captured it in Glasgow if we if we bothered, um, certainly less controversial than coal. But it came together with a reference to low emissions technologies. Uh, and renewable energy is kind of paired with these low emissions technologies. And no one, at least I'm not uh, entirely sure what that means, but it didn't seem to be an effort to increase ambition, but rather maybe to, to tamper it down, uh, you know, an acknowledgement that dependence on fossil fuels will continue for some time. And then we're going to have to find technologies, whether it's carbon capture and storage uh, or something else that will have to mitigate the, the impacts of those technologies. But it's a shame um, that in the context of producing a, a long-term vision uh, that we would have to have that included in the mix. We'll see how it plays out in, uh, in practice. But let me stop there. Thank you. And um, I don't know if Emmanuel Ahmed, if you don't have um, immediate reactions, maybe I'll give you a chance to come back in your final remarks. I'm also very much aware of the time. We've had several questions um, from the audience and especially on, on the next steps and COP28. So I would like to come back to this. Um, so what is it that we need now um, if we want to stay on track with the Glasgow Pact, uh, if we want to stay on track? still with 1.5 degrees. I, I, I am gathering from the remarks that you're saying is that the 1.5 degrees is still alive. Do correct me if I'm wrong. Um, last year, we were, uh, we, it was said that uh, it's uh, hanging by a thread. So I'm not sure <laughs> what is hanging by now, but uh, do correct uh, me if I've understood you wrong. But what is it that is needed now? Um, and will COP28 uh, be important? How important it is? Uh, is it more of a transitional COP for something else? So what are your expectations, expectations and hopes going towards COP28? And obviously, uh, what do you hope uh, for, for the next, uh, next COP? And I would like to couple this, and th this would be my final uh, final question and this will be the final round so obviously do use that occasion to come back to any other messages you would like to um you would like to have but reading a lot of uh, and this is obviously coming from a very european perspective but reading a lot of the articles about the outcomes there is a lot of uh, kind of i would say frustration about a lot of the outcomes and i would just like to kind of finish also with just the message of hope uh, what is it that you would say to those people, be it young or old, uh, be it from developed or from the developing world? What would you say to those um, who are frustrated uh, by countries and governments' failure to scale up efforts and act now to cut emissions? Where is it that people can find hope? Uh, where should they focus their attention? And uh, just I would hope to um, end with a positive note here, which is why I'm posing this question at the end. So um, maybe Emmanuel, if it's okay, we can start with you. 
Sure. Um, quite a few things um, need to happen uh, next year. So I'll just um, um, highlight a few and I'm sure um, others will be um, able to um, uh, complement that. Um, first, as we've um, discussed um, already quite at length, um, um, I think um, uh, the agenda of reforming um, the international financial institutions um, um, is going to be key. Um, and it includes a number of things. Um, um, as I said, um, the capital adequacy framework um, review, which is very much um, on the agenda um, of the G20. Um, um, India has the presidency um, uh, for uh, the G20 next year. Uh, they seem to be firmly committed uh, to making progress on that agenda. Um, I think it needs to go beyond um, essentially um, uh, using uh, um, um, some of the um, um, existing capital of those um, um, uh, multilateral development banks, in particular, what is called the callable uh, capital, to make sure uh, that more um, is used um, to support um, um, investment, um, in particular in the clean energy uh, transition. Um, but not only, um, uh, we need to uh, be able to rely uh, much better, um, I think, um, on tools like uh, guarantees, uh, such as what um, MIGA is doing, um, which is um, um, what crowds in uh, uh, private sector investment um, as opposed to uh, crowding it out. Um, and we'll need to talk about um, recapitalization um, um, of um, uh, the um, um, MDBs beyond um, uh, what's already in there, uh, very much as part of a package um, of things that do not only um, include um, climate action. Um, I think it's very important. Um, there are um, other uh, pressing demands uh, from uh, recipient countries. So I think, I think the agenda for uh, the reform of the um, IFIs um, uh, will need to uh, uh, crystallize a bit more. Uh, then we'll need to make um, uh, progress um, on NDC um, enhancement. Um, and, you know, without being um, specific about you know um, uh, the legal nature of such moves um, it is it is very much my hope that um, uh, Europe is um, at the center uh, of rebuilding um, the uh, coalitions um, that need to be built um, uh, to do this because it's very difficult for a single country or a single region um, to move together um, I think we're progressively pivoting in Europe from um, the immediate response to um, a very severe um, energy crisis where inevitably uh, the focus initially um, was um, uh, very much um, onto finding alternative uh, sources for uh, supplying the gas to, um, in fact, an acceleration of the effort on um, energy efficiency and energy savings um, and renewables, um, that, that translates um, um, hopefully um, into accelerated climate action um, in Europe. Um, and I think we need to think as Europeans um, about the um, other countries, um, big and small, large emitters and vulnerable countries um, um, that um, um, we take on board uh, to uh, really make uh, progress um, on um, NDC enhancement. And it's a very difficult um, question. Uh, but I think this is um, what's on the agenda uh, for um, next year. Um, in terms of hope, um, uh, there was a lot of hope, uh, by the way, um, at times in encounters with uh, uh, people um, 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 in um, um, not necessarily the negotiating rooms, uh, uh, but, um, you know, uh, the big uh, uh, circus um, in, in Charm el -Chien. Uh, we're uh, working with um, youth activists um, in different uh, geographies in Europe, uh, uh, but also in other geographies, um, um, in Africa in particular, um, and they are um, having an impact um, on what um, uh, governments um, and businesses and investors um, are doing, um, holding them um, accountable. Um, um, you know, uh, those are 
uh, tedious um, fights um, each and every time, uh, but they get a lot of energy uh, from the wins uh, they get. Um, I also um, personally uh, got um, energized by talking with many parliamentarians um, who um, attended the COP, um, including a large delegation of parliamentarians from um, African countries, um, um, absolutely on top um, of what needs to happen uh, to pass climate um, legislation, um, and very much keen to discuss the role that parliaments um, have to play to hold governments accountable, but also really walk the talk and move towards um, implementation. So uh, at a very personal level, uh, this is also where um, I am taking um, a lot of hope um, and energy from uh, those discussions. Great, thank you. Ahmed, I'll hand over to you. Thanks. Thanks, Annika. Well, I will, like I fully agree with uh, Emmanuel. <clears throat> so very briefly, I, I think what we have to do is maintain the momentum happened in Sharm el-Sheikh. COP28 is important of, or not. Of course, it's very important, transitional or not. As I say, in my point of view, it's a, it's a, it's a process. So it's not Sharm el-Sheikh, Abu Dhabi, Glasgow, whatever. It's a, it's a process that we build up and, 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 and we have to, to keep doing this. Um, <clears throat> what we have agreed, the outcomes, that's what we should work on. On mitigation, we keep pushing for the NDCs, everyone to update their NDCs, all the parties, for the adaptation, uh, uh, Glasgow Sharm el adaptation program, uh, double up the uh, adaptation uh, uh, goal, uh, on, on, um, and, and then uh, uh, until uh, we reach conclusions in COP28 on loss and damage, we have the fund now, but so what we need to do is explore how we will mobilize and where and, and we, which country will get what amount of money, as Jacob was saying, we know now which country need what and which country is more of priority than the other. So uh, we need to, 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 to work more on the operations of this, of this fund so that it's, it's not just an initiative that we agreed upon and, and achieved nothing because that will bring us back into the same vicious circle of uh, vulnerable and developing countries complaining that uh, funding of adaptation is not met now it will be funding of loss and damage is not met. So, so we don't want to repeat uh, ourselves again. So mitigation, adaptation, loss and damage, again, implementation is a key. We have to, to keep uh, pushing uh, for uh, implementing all of uh, this. Um, uh, I agree with Emmanuel when it comes to, uh, to finance. So guarantees, grants, uh, involvement of, of private sector is, is, is very important. Um, energy efficiency and renewables, that's, that, that's, that's the key. Uh, I think that's the key for, for, for a lot of things. The, the, the transition, the green transition in, in general is the key if we are facing the climate, uh, to face climate change challenges and also to, to face the challenge of, of, of the energy security we're having now. So accelerating that transition is, I think, is a must. And is a must in a way that we should and it should be in a manner of solidarity. It's not that uh, it's a must that we have to do it and we have to, to, to pay if the countries that won't be able to cope with the transition, they have to pay for it in a way of taxes or carbon uh, taxes, etc. cetera. So uh, uh, that's, yeah, that's, that's my main uh, takeaway. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And Jake, final word. <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, I, I think that there, there are two uh, ways of thinking about hope in this context. One is that, that hope um, always emerges when you look further into the future than your immediate challenges. And I think that the risk that we face in moving towards uh, Dubai next year and the global stock take is that all the political attention will begin to move towards the post-2030 period, as that GST is supposed to inform our next round of NDCs. So I think we need to caution against hope turning in that direction uh, at, at the risk of losing um, the pressure that we need to keep on action in the, in the pre-2030 period. So yes, um, we, we can sort of open our minds and, and imagine how the conditions in 2035 or 2040 will allow us to accelerate action even further. But let's not forget that we have to continue to, to build the foundation here and now uh, if we want to keep 1.5 in reach. 
The other observation I hope I would make is that um, from the perspective of climate negotiators, there's one kind of negotiator, and I guess I would put myself in this category, where my real hopes rest outside of this process. I, you know, I think that the big system changes that we're looking for can be catalyzed uh, by decisions that we take here, but the hard work lies elsewhere. So if you're thinking about loss and damage, there is the fund, but believe me, the real hope lies within the funding arrangements that capture the kinds of institutions that Emmanuel keeps pointing us towards, where you know the billions rest and where the real form needs to be achieved if we're going to create change. So that's one kind of negotiator. You know, the hope lies elsewhere. The other kind of negotiator is I, I can't control what happens elsewhere. All I can manage is what my delegation as a small country that isn't sitting with significant votes on the board of the IMF or the World Bank can do. So my hope rests here. And I think what we have to try to figure out how we can do is to kind of combine those hopes in a way that we as climate negotiators have to make sure that we're making promises about World Bank reform or IMF reform in this context, that we remember that there are many of the players that aren't empowered to affect those decisions. And so we have to carry their hopes out of this process and into others and fulfill our responsibilities there through our finance ministries, through our leaders, uh, and through the institutions that we continue to have more power to affect than they do. Thank you for that. And I hope that it has also for our audience left a bit of uh, feeling of hope indeed uh, that uh, we still, the 1.5 degrees is still alive as long as we are accelerating the action. And obviously that comes down to both the implementation and scaling up the efforts. And it is uh, it is very interesting to look at also what happens to the commitments that are made, uh, because ultimately that does show the level of ambition and uh, level of um, implementation. And so from our side uh, at EPC, we are very keen on coming back to this discussion year and year after um, to see where we are uh, with the hope that indeed, um, again, next year, uh, we will see real shift and acceleration in action. And obviously, as this discussion has yet reminded us, uh, we know that COP is only one of the processes. It's an, a processes and so on, one of the for us. It's an occasion for our leaders to come together to discuss needed measures, to discuss the level of ambition, and well, I do gather from this discussion um, and that certainly our leaders could probably have done and could have done much more. In the end, the real work is done elsewhere and nothing stops us from doing more than what has been discussed and what has been agreed at COP. And it is not just for the governments to deliver. And there's a role for our businesses, cities, citizens across the world who also have the interest and they do also have means to contribute to climate action. And I think, I guess that would be my kind of final word of hope that everyone does have a role in this and that COP27 is just one of the channels for bringing about the change. But thank you so much for joining in this is discussion and shedding light of what was happening in the negotiating rooms as well as in the corridors, in the preparations uh, for the COP and what can be expected as next steps. And uh, we, on our side, look forward to following and engaging in these discussions and wishing you all the best in the work that you do. And good afternoon to all of our participants. Thank you for joining. Bye.